Welcome, everybody. Um, let me just start by recognizing the, uh, well, providing particular thanks to the people listed on this slide, Yelena, Matt, Roy, Barney, Aspil, and Isabel, Luke, Vincent, um, for uh, the work that they've been doing with us and developing the ROB2 tool, and to recognize that it's been a large endeavor with quite a lot of people working within and outside of Cochrane, um, talking to us, uh, working with us to, to create this tool. Um, and also to acknowledge that uh, development was funded by the Medical Research Council in the UK um, and it's building on, uh, as many of you know, uh, a previous tool that was, was funded by, by Cochrane. So this is what we're going to uh, cover during this webinar. Um, I'm going to start by saying a few words um, about uh, the uh, historical context, saying something about the original risk of bias tool and explaining why we felt there was a need to develop uh, a new version. Then I'll hand over to Jonathan, who will talk a bit more about what the tool looks like. Um, it'll be an overview of the tool with the next five webinars. We'll go into detail in the five particular domains that are covered. And uh, he'll tell us how it works in general. Then I'll say a bit about some of the resources available if you want to learn more about the tool. Then we'll hand over to Tess, who will talk about using the ROB2 tool in, in, in the Cochrane context and, and also about what sort of issues would need to be covered in a systematic review protocol uh, now that ROB2 is, is, a, is around. We should start by making sure we all have the same understanding of what we're talking about when we say bias. We, we define bias as a systematic error or deviation from the truth. Uh, reflecting the situation that sometimes a study will be systematically overestimating or underestimating the effect of an intervention. This is something that's beyond random error that we're always going to see. Uh, many people use the word internal validity. Uh, we're essentially talking about that. Um, another way of thinking about it is whether the result that we have um, reflects what the study is trying to estimate. And, and we draw a clean distinction between internal validity and external validity otherwise known as generalizability or indirectness within the grade framework, which is how relevant the study is to other situations. We're not talking about relevance, we're talking about bias, whether we get uh, a result that is systematically correct. And we draw a distinction between some, some other notions that have been uh, wrapped up in, in related discussions. A lot of the early approaches to thinking about um, the uh, critical uh, assessment of uh, studies within systematic reviews talks about quality. We've moved away from the word quality. Uh, quality sort of says the signal that we're thinking about whether people did a good job. Now, bias can occur even in very well conducted studies because some biases cannot be controlled in some circumstances. On the other hand, some things that are um, hallmarks of poor research don't necessarily introduce bias. Like if you fail, fail to get ethical approval or if you don't do a sample size application. They don't directly introduce bias. We're not talking about bad reporting. Um, good methods have been used but not reported. Of course, we need good reporting to understand biases, but we're not talking about quality of reporting. And as I said before, we're not talking about imprecision, which is random error, which is reflected in the competence interview. Over the years, many tools have been developed to look at uh, issues around bias or quality in, in trials. There are lots of scales, lots of checklists. Uh, a lot of them include things that aren't related to bias because some of them are explicitly trying to look at quality, so are not really fit for the purpose we want here. Um, different scales can lead to different conclusions and numerical scales, the vast majority of us in the bias methods group in Cochrane will, uh, have a, uh, an opinion that uh, these are not really justified. There's very little empirical basis for weighting different items to produce a summary number. So quality scales that end up with a score uh, are strongly recommended against uh, their use in Cochrane. But because there were no tools um, some, some years ago that we thought were really fit for use in Cochrane reviews, we developed this original tool that was uh, published in the 2008 version of the Cochrane Handbook, as you can see here. And, and we did a bit of revision before we published it in the BMJ three years later. Um, since we published that original tool, a lot has happened. A lot of people have done studies of the tool. Uh, there have been a lot of studies like this uh, by Lisa Hartley and colleagues on 
um, reliability of the tool. Uh, there have been in investigations of its implementation in systematic reviews. We've done our own evaluations, uh, asking people through focus group surveys how they feel about the tool. Um, and that came up with some recommendations, some of which we implemented in 2011, and some of them we, we were implementing now in ROG2. We've also looked at what, what everyone's written about the tool, critiques um, of the tool. And we've done some specific studies on particular aspects of the tool. And we've also in, in, in been engaging with uh, um, methodological developments in the field. And this is a paper Jonathan and I wrote with uh, Miguel Anan and Mohamed Mansouri. I'm trying to link the Cochrane risk of bias tool with modern developments in causal inference in epidemiology. And, I, and so across this accumulation of, of work, we, we pulled out a number of things that we thought really needed to be improved about the original version of the tool. And it, it had been used really simplistically. We knew that people weren't following the guidance. Um, it was easy not to follow the guidance. And people using it inconsistently, adding domains, removing domains, we didn't agree with most of those decisions. The reliability studies showed that it didn't have brilliant agreement rates. Uh, uh, yet there was a lot of use of the, the unclear, which was one of the risk of bias judgments we had in the tool, which is, itself was an um, ambiguous um, state of the judgment. We knew some of the domains were quite complex. We needed to tackle that. We didn't very well cover a lot of the issues that arise in unblinded trials. Uh, we didn't have versions for crossover trials or cluster randomized trials, and we didn't include an overall risk of bias judgment. So um, here's a slide that really tries to argue why we did need a new version. Um, it's, it's tried to implement things on the previous slide, but what we think we've come up with is something that is more appropriate in the sense it's more comprehensive of the biases it addresses, and it has versions, or very, very soon we'll have published versions for these other types of trials. We think it's more usable. We've introduced more structure um, and clearer guidance with built-in help to reach judgments within the tool. So we hope that will in, in increase the improve the reliability. It's more current in the sense that we've incorporated developments in in the science, particularly around the domains of missing data and uh, addressing issues in unblinded trials. And we think that from the systematic reviewer's perspective, it will be more useful because it does have an overall risk of bias judgment that can feed into um, primary analyses, um, exploring whether effects depend on risk of bias judgments or uh, looking at sensitivity analyses to whether we put things that are overall at higher or lower risk of bias into the synthesis. It's also allied with uh, other risk of bias tools that are being um, recommended for use in Cochrane reviews like Robin's Eye. So we published it in August last year in, in the BMJ, and we were able to include a chapter about it in the, uh, the revised version of the Cochrane Handbook, version six, that came out last September. And uh, just to know, I would say a bit more about this later, but uh, the primary resource of, for all information about the tool is our website, riskofbias.info. So I talked before about what we mean by bias. I just want to clarify that this concept of risk of bias is in, important both to this and the previous tool. We can't measure whether there's really bias in a study, but we can look for features of the study and of what happened in the study that are at higher or lower risk of bias. And we have empirical evidence that helps us do that and a lot of theor theoretical underpinning of, uh, of uh, how trials work and how people behave as well. Um, and I also want to make clear, here is one departure for those of you familiar with the first version of the tool, where we were one of the first, to, in fact, the first tool, I think, to, to associate risk of bias judgment with, with outcomes. Now we've gone one stage further and we've made it clear that really the risk of bias judgment is about a result. So it's not about a study for sure. It's not even about an outcome. It's about a result. So we only need to do a risk of bias assessment if we have a result. If we don't have a result from a study, then we don't need to stop worrying. We need to worry not about the study because the study, but we need to worry about the meta-analysis because it's missing evidence from that study, potentially. And so we need to think about a new for another framework that Matt Page has been developing um, to look at risk of bias due to missing evidence. And shortly he'll be uh, releasing a, a pilot version of the Rob ME tool for missing evidence. And just to clarify those ideas through a diagram, you think about what happens in a trial, 
um, a child will be looking at a, an outcome domain, we might call it, such as depression, but it'll pick an outcome measure to look at that, maybe the Beck depression inventory. It'll have to choose a time point at which to measure that, maybe 12 weeks after the start of intervention. And then we'll collect um, the outcomes of all the participants and whatever will have a set of outcome data. And the next step is to analyze those to compare the two groups and produce the result. And that's the result that is potential to be biased. And that's what is the focus of a ROB2 assessment. So my final slide here is just to give uh, an initial, uh, very brief overview of, of ROB2. Um, Jonathan will say a bit more, and as I said, the next few webinars will elaborate on these in great detail. So we've got five bias domains, which are fixed. Um, they're all mandatory and none can be added. Um, we also will have versions for crossover and cluster randomized trials. We do include an overall risk of bias judgment, as I've suggested before. And there's an important development that Jonathan will say a bit about in, in, before one starts an assessment, clarifying what's the effect we're interested in estimating from this trial. And just a quick note that um, we recognize the in, immense importance of looking at funding and vested interests. And these need to be evaluated in trials. Um, but they can have multiple imp implications for uh, review, and they are not directly within ROB2, but they should be used appropriately to inform ROB2 assessments. And, uh, and third tool, sorry about all the tools, um, that uh, Asbjorn Krobjotsen is, is, is leading development with Isabel Boutron and others, uh, the TACIT tool is looking at uh, how to pick out conflicts of interests um, so that they can appropriately inform our ROB2 assessments and other aspects of a review. 